Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Health and Wealth Podcast with your hosts, Tim and Carter. What's trending in Richards? Carter Wilcoxon, founder of CSI Financial Group here with my co-host and former wealth advisor, Tim James, founder of chemicalfreebody.com and your new health advisor. This is the show where we reveal the connection between physical and financial abundance. Hey, welcome back in Richards. Carter Wilcoxon coming to you from uh, warm triple digit Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it is coming up on summertime here in Phoenix. So that's why, uh, you know, that's what uh, is to ex- to be expected out here in Phoenix. But as is normal, I am joined today by my fantastic chemical free body himself co-host, Mr. Tim James. Timmy, how are you, my man? <laughs> I'm doing well, Carter. Doing well. Thanks for uh, being my partner in this uh, ride we call life. <laughs> Dude, absolutely my pleasure. And, uh, you know, it's been it's been a while since we've actually recorded one of these. Um, you know, we were we kind of took a break in a little hiatus there in the first quarter of uh, 2023, but uh, we're getting our seminar. I'm almost at seminar season going again, which is you know kind of a play on what our advisors do that are out there listening today. They're probably in full on seminar season mode, which True. is why I said that. But um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm really excited to be able to bring on our our guest today, someone that I've known. For we were just talking pre-show, you know, um, over a dozen years now, and it's been it's been an interesting journey that he's had. But I, I asked him not too long ago. Now that he's got sort of like this new venture going on, I said, "Hey, I said, would you be open to being a guest on the podcast?" So he said, "Sure." So let's go ahead and bring in from uh, Puerto Vallarta, uh, Mexico, Jeff Cothy. Jeff, how are you, buddy? I'm fantastic. Thanks, Carter. And it's not quite as hot as Arizona here. It's only about 92 here today. So. <laughs> it's nice. still warm. Yeah. Still well, warm. well, you were showing me that you're about, uh, you know, a, a thousand yards away from the Pacific Ocean. So being at 92 and that close to the to the water is probably not as bad as in Phoenix if it gets too hot, right? I'm on vacation every day I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it is kind of nice. Oh, that, that's awesome. Well, hey, and Richards, we're really thankful for you to be able to join us for another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast Show. Um, so as is normal, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're just going to ask Jeff a series of questions, starting off with, um, you know, how did you initially, you know, it's been we've known each other for quite some time, but how did you initially get into more of the financial services slash marketing arena? Like what led you to bring sure. you into that field? Sure. Uh, believe it or not, my insurance career basically started with the end of my college career. Uh, when I graduated uh, college from the University of Illinois in 1985, the unemployment rate in Illinois was a little over 14 percent. It was crazy. Uh, I had my resume in everywhere, applications and so forth. And I finally ended up taking a commission insurance job because they would take me. It's commission, right? They're, they're not out anything. So. Uh, I started working with a, a company called Combined Insurance out of Chicago, W. Clement Stone, and uh, only stayed there for a short while because in, I think in the, the 90 days I was there, they had about 150% turnover rate. It was a revolving door. Anyway, uh, got into Medicare supplements and eventually uh, expanded my, my world into life insurance and annuities. Uh, a lot of it came because I had a, a, a couple of family members who basically got fleeced, I call it fleeced, by financial experts, and I'm putting my little quote fingers up. Uh, we found out that both of them were out of the business about just a few weeks later, but in that, in that short time, six to eight weeks, they had lost about a third to a half of their retirement funds. I said, man, there's got to be a better way. Uh, I became somewhat of an expert on IRAs and qualified money and that type of thing and uh, started working in the state of Wisconsin. I moved up to Wisconsin. I, I, I call it escape from Illinois, but we'll leave that to your own life. Uh, I became involved in, with an agency out of Dallas, Texas. Now, this is kind of a story. It may make a, a, a difference, but bear with me. There is a purpose to this. There was an agency based out of Dallas, Texas, that was setting my appointments for me. I was giving up a large chunk of my commission, but I literally had uh, one, two, or three appointments any day I wanted them. And I was writing four or five pieces of business every week, and things were going great. And 
Then, uh, so I got promoted within the first couple of months. Uh, got promoted again to management about six weeks later, I believe it was. And that promotion allowed me to find out that the the calling center that they were using was ignoring the do not call list. The insurance commissioner in Wisconsin took umbrage to that. <laughs> uh, when I was management, that's the reason I left that organization. I said, wait a minute, you guys are they're ignoring the rules and the laws. There's going to be trouble here. I'm out. And I resigned from the company. And even though the money was going like crazy, but uh, about a year and a half later, I got a letter from the uh, Department of Insurance in Wisconsin, and they wanted to talk to me about my license. I'm like, okay, that can't be good, right? Um, I was being accused of a couple things. One was unsuitable sales, and that's the one that they were they were uh, most uh, targeted, I want to say, because the word unsuitable sales, uh, the words unsuitable sales are basically a... Uh, it's a perspective thing. They can decide it's unsuitable and, and then you're done. Uh, so I was worried about that one the most. They also said uh, that there was a couple other things where uh, I was using scare tactics and, and giving them the, the worst news ever of what ifs and then the market and that kind of thing. And I wasn't. I wasn't using any of the promotional material of the company. And I promise this is going to work. Uh, there was a total of six charges of only three of them they actually brought up and two of those got dropped out and all they wanted to do was talk about the unsuitable cases. There were three different cases that they had in front of me. Two of them, no money ever changed hands. And I thought, well, how do you make an unsuitable sale if no money changed hands? And it turns out they don't care. Uh, the third one was a gentleman who had checked out the deals with his uh, family members and his financial advisor and everybody gave the green light. And a year later, after he had taken out a 10% withdrawal, which was part of the plan I drew up for him, uh, he, they were calling that an unsuitable sale. So, uh, and I even had some of them saying, oh, he's a really nice man. I hope nothing bad happens from this. And I thought they, they went after me and, and it didn't matter uh, what was going on. Uh, with my lawyer or anybody, any representation, they were going to make an example out of me because of where I belong. The reason I bring this all up, I said there was a reason I promised, uh, is because sometimes it does not matter how careful you are and how closely you follow the law. Uh, it sometimes can turn to bite you. As I said, I found out the bad part about the, the uh, do not call list and said, okay, goodbye. A year and a half later, they came after me because I was management, they said I must have been part of the problem. Uh, and by the way, the attorney, the commissioner, and the judge all worked in the same office, and they were appointed uh, by the governor. And I had to explain what an annuity was to the judge. And I went, this guy's going to decide if it's unsuitable, and he doesn't even know what it is. So anyway, that all makes sense. Is that, that I, I eventually got there, I promised, and I got there, right? That's perfect. But, and you know, you're exactly right. You know, there's a lot of listeners right now that, um, you know, that deal with suitability and, you know, especially whenever you're working, you know, in the, in the boomer or senior market, especially, right. It's, right. it's you can follow every single thing. You can document every single thing and perception is reality, right? It, it's, it, it only matters on what subjectively can happen to you. And a lot of those instances, and you got, really caught up in the middle of that is what it sounds like. And you're absolutely right. And the thing that's interesting is this was about 20 years ago. The suitability issue is a much stronger issue now. And that was back when it wasn't that big a deal. And then again, how do you call unsuitable sale when you don't have any money exchange? That made no sense to me at all. Anyway. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. So, um, so what happened from there? So, so you're no longer in the insurance field, so to speak, right? So now what no does yeah. that lead you no, to next? No longer in the insurance field. I had my license revoked. And just so you know, there's three kinds of people when it comes to the insurance industry. There's licensed people, non-licensed people, and down below that is the revoked people. That's me. I, I am restricted from dealing with anybody that I, I can't talk to a, a client about insurance and that kind of thing. Uh, the interesting thing is I can talk to agents uh, you know, and representatives all day long and explain to them what I know. And with the amount of experience I've had, that's where I've basically taken my, my expertise and said, you know what, I can use my experience to help other people 
get better at what they do. So since that time, I've been working with IMOs as a marketer, uh, doing things like recruiting, uh, motivating the agents, assisting agents in sales, uh, the, the techniques, not the words, the questions, those kind of things, uh, mostly in life insurance and annuities. Uh, my years as an insurance agent were seen as a resource. Typically, I heard a lot of agents say, yeah, over at XYZ, uh, the, the guy who's just telling me this is just repeating what the, the owner of the company says or what makes them the most money. And I didn't hear that. Uh, I heard, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Thanks. And what can I do? Uh, to give you an example, and, and Carter, you know this, back, back in the day when we were both uh, you know, in the same kind of stomping grounds, uh, I took a, a couple of brothers in Georgia. Uh, I was able to take them from $4 million a year in annuity production to over $12 million a year in one year span. Uh, that was with the, I, I'm not going to go into products. I don't think that's important because it's not around anymore anyway. But uh, tweaking their presentation a little bit, tweaking the product and the, the, the way it was presented with guarantees and that type of thing. Got them the help they needed by giving them a stronger offering is what happened. So I, I helped agents uh, in my recruiting efforts at that same place. I helped agents that were newly contracted. In other words, they weren't doing anything prior. So their, their starting line was absolutely zero. And the first year they got to $56 million in one year. And I tell you that not to brag. I tell you that to explain that I've been in the industry for quite a long time. And I would say with at least a modicum of success. So, but eventually my path led me to uh, working as a, a marketer for CSI Financial Group. Uh, and that's where I learned a lot more about how indexed in universal life can help fund tax-free retirement for many people. Uh, there is... <laughs> Andrew Victor is an amazing person when it comes to figuring out the math on how to make uh, money that goes in come out tax-free and a whole bunch of it. So uh, the, the thing that, that I, I really liked about that was I know there's an awful lot of people who would love to be able to do that and don't really know how. And there was a system put in place to be able to explain how that would happen uh, you know, for the, for the client. So what I did was I said, you know what? I want to make a, a, a program that will align the, the agents with the typically a business owner who's looking for the higher dollar amounts for the tax-free retirement because of all the taxes they end up paying from their business and so forth. Uh, wanted to get them uh, the ability to close more deals. Uh, what I was seeing with at, at CSI was there were several people uh, people that I was escorting in that were, they loved the idea. The, the concept was fantastic and they just wouldn't pull the trigger. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a fix to that. And I, and I thought, you know what, what if you were to say, uh, what if I could give you Mr. Business owner or Miss Business owner, I guess you got to be careful these days, right? Yep. Uh, Mr. Or Miss Business owner, what would you say if I told you I could get you $100,000 or more per year, tax-free, every year from age 67 on, assuming you're 50 years old, and still have over a million dollars left for your family, and not a penny comes out of your pocket to fund that whole program. Mr. Mrs. Business Owner, what do you think? Would you like to at least take a look at that program? And I found the program that'll do that. A little bit more about you. And, uh, you know, last question before we take our, our first commercial break, because I can see we're coming up against the clock here. But um, so you are now currently in part of IARTA. And I think it's I think one of the interesting things about you that I, I found interesting, if you don't mind, you know, uh, to get a little bit personal, um, you have a a bride, right? Talk a little bit, if you don't mind, tell us a story about your significant other, I guess, and uh, and kind of how that all came about. Okay, you opened a can of worms, I'll close it for you. Okay, <laughs> so about five and a half years ago, I married a Russian woman, and we won't go into the number of American women I've divorced. Let's leave that alone. <laughs> uh, married a Russian woman when she was in America on a visitor's visa. I went to Russia and I met her. She came back to America on a visitor's visa. Uh, she had that because 
go figure. Her son was a really good hockey player. Insert Russian hockey player joke here. Uh, and uh, so when she came back here, uh, we, everything was going great, except I got a call from her son in Russia that said that her father had just died. His grandfather had just passed away very suddenly, was not sick a day in his life. And uh, so I asked my attorney, this was back when the Trump-Russia thing was a big deal. And not that it isn't now, but bigger deal. And uh, I asked my attorney, what's the, the best way to guarantee that she's able to come back into the country? And my attorney said, well, probably to get married. And even though we had planned on getting married, we really didn't plan on doing it in the next 14 days, but that's when it happened. If you ever get a chance to do a wedding in 14 days, pass. It's a little stressful. <laughs> time uh, out. Time out. I did the same thing, and I had 14 days. It, it, it Wasn't it a little stressful? Yeah, it was just pretty much a shotgun wedding just at our house, yeah. and it was great. We just had intimate people come because my uh, – well, she was my girlfriend, and – she had come up. I was doing uh, another business. I was importing stone, and I was visiting uh, Lima, Peru, and I had one of my uh, the quarries down there. I was getting some of the tile and stuff. I had met her down there, and then we talked on the phone for six months, and then she came up on a tourist visa for six months and went back home, came back up on another tourist visa, and was just about ready to go. And um, we just contacted, and I, I proposed to her, and then we talked to an attorney. I proposed, but it wasn't like, let's get married now. It's just like, we'll just get married whenever. Yeah. And then we called an attorney. We called an attorney just to find out because we knew that she was from a different country. Just curious. And, and he's like, well, you actually, uh, he goes, I'm actually surprised she was able to come back on that second visa. If she leaves, you might not even see each other for a year before she can come back again. We were like, well, we don't want that. So we got married. <laughs> so, and we had 14 days to do it so that's freaking hilarious i don't know that's exactly yeah the same. almost the same exact story yeah the, the, the reason that we got married so quickly was she had to get home to help her mother with the estate of the of her father uh the estate laws in russia are absolutely crazy the first thing they do is they freeze all assets for six months so just when you need money to bury a loved one you don't have it it's frozen so it was crazy well her mother is legally blind was legally blind and get that into the story and uh so she needed extra help and uh, she went home and got the estate basically settled and it took a year it took a believe it or not she was gone for a year and then mother's health started to go down she had nine either aneurysms or strokes or combinations of the both at that point it was like okay they gave her all kinds of medication the medication gave her basically dementia and when you're blind and you have dementia, you wake up every 20 to 30 minutes and you start picking things up, trying to figure out where the heck you are. And so my wife would, and she'd got no sleep for about four months. And I said, this is killing you. Literally, you need to get help or you need to get mother to a place where she can get help. And she really couldn't find anybody that she trusted. And she always felt like she was going to be there anyway if she got help in the house. I said, find a nursing home. She found one that would accept the pension of mother and no more payment was needed. And I was like, that's a no brainer. She, that's all they take. That's good. Uh, if I said, check it out, make sure it's a good place. She went, looked at it. It was fine. Uh, mother stayed there for like, it was only a few weeks before she passed away. She went downhill really fast. Uh, maybe a good thing. You make your own judgments there, but then she passed away. But it was about a month after the Ukrainian war started. So now I've got a Russian woman in Moscow trying to get back to the United States, and she can't because the whole world has shut themselves off from Russia. So I said, OK, I talking to my lawyer. We looked up all kinds of possibilities. OK, I've heard of celebrities saying, you know, this politics is, is BS. I'm going to go to another country. Well, dang it, I did it. Uh, I, uh, I went to uh, Belize. For about three months, because uh, Tanya, my wife, went to a, 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 some kind of a service in Russia that said, we'll do the paperwork, give us six, seven weeks, and we'll be able to get you into Belize. Belize had signed some kind of a treaty. There was an exchange. They were okay with it. We chose Belize because they spoke English and recognized the United States dollar. It's like, hey, perfect. Didn't necessarily want my, my Russian wife who five and a half years or four and a half, yeah, five and a half years earlier did not speak English at all. 
but didn't want her to have to learn another language. So uh, went to Belize and nine weeks later or so, uh, she got the word that Russia reneged on the offer and she can't go. I said, okay, well, next best choice is uh, into Mexico. Mexico, she could get in without a visa at all. The problem was getting out of Russia, not into Mexico. Russia doesn't want their citizens to leave unless they're coming back. Because a lot of people with what's going on, they don't want to come back so bad. So uh, we had to figure out an itinerary and make up some kind of a, you know, we, we fabricated some of her story to get her into another country. Finally got her into uh, Mexico uh, on the 5th of May, Cinco de Mayo. I thought that's good timing. That's ironic. And, yeah, well, and I had been here since the 1st of May is all. I, I had a lease I got out of and, and made the trip. and. Uh, so we, we came to Puerto Vallarta and chose that because of some of the things we read about tourism. It's less touristy here in Puerto Vallarta versus Cabo and Cancun, et cetera. And, uh, we decided that we'd try this and I found a, a really nice place about, you know, it's, it might be five, 600 yards from the, the Harbor here and uh, get to see the cruise ships come in and so forth. But anyway, my wife is here. We still have to do some things paperwork wise to get her visa extended. But I found one really cool thing is that if I get residency, dual residency in Mexico, because she's my wife, she automatically gets it, whether she's Russian or not. I thought that is fantastic. So where there's a will, there's a way. And yeah, I think that's yeah. a good time to. That's awesome. That's a good story. And I'm glad that um, you found a path. So it's it's a perfect example um, of anything in life. Basically, if you if you really desire something bad enough, you'll figure it out. Yeah. And. And you, you guys did that. I'm really happy for you. So we're going to take Appreciate a quick break. When we get back, we're going to be chatting with Jeff about what he's doing right now to help advisors help their clients uh, protect and grow their money. We'll be right back. Estate planning. What does that even mean? When the inevitable happens for everyone on this planet, your estate plan kicks into action. But first, let's start with what an estate is. An estate is simply everything you own. Now, here's the issue and what needs to be understood when this event occurs. You only have two choices on this plan. Number one, either you plan how your estate gets handed out and distributed to those you leave behind. Or number two, your state decides who gets everything you own. For the first time ever, you can now take complete and total control of this plan that you've been deprived of for most of your life and generations before you. You can get personalized assistance along the way with a team of specialists whose job it is to make sure you have true peace of mind. It's important to understand that estate planning is a journey and rest assured that our team will be available to you all along the way and at every step. Welcome to eState Plan, home of the last estate plan you'll ever need. To learn more, make sure to reach out to your local advisor licensed with us or go to our website for more information. What's up, Enrichers? Tim James here. I'm back with my co-host, Carter Wilcoxon. Today in the house, we've got Jeff. And Jeff has been um, in the industry for a long time. He's now helping advisors grow their practice. But not only that, you're going to share with us five points to help the advisor help their clients with their businesses, but also help the advisor with their business. Tell us more. Okay. Uh, I was in the, in the industry for an awful long time, and I had an awful lot of people telling me, that I'm, I'm pretty good at teaching things, coaching and that kind of thing. And I started looking into the coaching aspect, uh, partially because of the uh, the ups and downs of the insurance world with the, the, the finance rates and all that kind of stuff. Marketing and recruiting got to be difficult. Not that I'm afraid of that. But uh, so I started looking into the coaching idea and I found a way that I can talk to a business about their profit and their profit margin without making them one, spend money, and two, having to get more revenue. Uh, an awful lot of business owners out there think that, that it takes more revenue to make more profit, and that's not true at all. Uh, I've got a software that is fantastic, and I'm not selling it, by the way. Don't, don't tune out yet. Uh, <laughs> I've got a software that can look into a company's numbers, and there's 40 different aspects that I can touch on. And in most cases, 
with about three or four categories, I can find an average business at least 50000 many times over $100,000 in extra revenue and generate even higher profit margin at the same time. Uh, and, and I can give you all kinds of examples. Just a, a couple of, of uh, just in summary, I just did a, a program for a, a child care center that was doing about a million dollars a year in revenue. And I was able to find them over $240,000 in revenue at a almost 28% profit margin. That's a lot of money they were leaving on the table. And we weren't talking about them spending a dime on marketing or advertising. We were talking about doing things like, and I'll, I'll get into the, the five things that uh, we, you mentioned there. The first one is called market dominating position. Quite frankly, it's what do you do better or differently than your competition? Let me give you a, an interesting idea on how market dominating position is so important. Let's say you were a real estate agent and you were at a, a chamber of commerce meeting and they gave you 20 seconds, 30 seconds to introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do and, and that kind of thing. If I was to say, hi, I'm Jeff, I'm a real estate agent. I've been in this area for about 15 years. I've got a good track record. If you or anyone you know wants to buy or sell a house, let me know. And quite frankly, every one of those statements could be responded to properly with the words, well, I would hope so, because that's what a real estate agent does, right? So the idea is to go, wait a minute, let's talk about interrupting the conversation in the head of the person that's listening and get their attention. So instead of that, change that to, hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a real estate agent, been in this area for 15 years. I got a great track record of being able to help people afford a much bigger house than they ever thought they could. If anybody, if you or anybody you know is looking for a house bigger than what they thought they could, let me know. And the, the conversation in the head goes from, well, I would hope so from, wow, I wonder if I could afford a, a bigger house. Hey, I know somebody that's got four kids and they're looking for a bigger house and they can't afford it. The conversation changed entirely in their head and just to give you an idea, we did that with one real estate agent and he got about 75% more revenue when he started changing that, that one key part of his marketing. That Just that one thing changed 75%. Now, if you know anything about the real estate market, you know that there's not a whole lot of overhead except for the, you know, the advertising. 75% increase in revenue was, was probably another 60% more in profit. And that's a big, big number. So... Uh, do you guys have any questions about how market dominating position is important? And no, I got that. So uh, let's go on okay, to number okay. two. What's number two? Okay, well, this number number two, and and I tried to make these as as simplistic as possible, so you could go, oh yeah, I could probably do that. Uh, the next one is is what I call joint ventures and affiliates. In other words, what products or services do people normally buy before, during, or after they do business with you? Uh, for example, you're probably not going to go down as a, as a financial advisor, or an insurance agent, you're probably not going to go down to the nearest ice cream shop and try to find people that try to find referrals there. You might be headed more toward uh, a place, you know, the art museum and those kind of things, some place where more affluent people would, would maybe hang out. And those may be horrible examples. My point hopefully has been made that if you talk to people who also have the same type of clients that you do, you've got a lot better chance of being successful. The other thing is you may find somebody that could use some help in their business and they may give you a commission for referring some people to them. Maybe it's a, a client you've already got. Okay. One of your past clients that said, Hey, if you're looking for this, they've got this. And so the, the joint venture affiliate thing is a way to make a little extra money, not only for your business, but from theirs. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So the, the next one comes under the category of leads. Now, I don't know too many people that aren't in my, in my 30, almost 38 years in the insurance industry. I'm not sure I've talked to too many people that didn't say the words, Hey, what do you got for a lead program? What, what can I do for leads? How can I get more qualified people, more comma qualified people? And unfortunately the lead industry has been changed a lot by the advertising industry. Let me explain what I mean. There's a lot of marketing out there 
that really provides no compelling reason for the customer to buy. Uh, they, it, a lot of it is based on how, how we can get their attention in something flashy. Okay. Uh, I always, I always like to throw this one out there. Did anybody change to drinking Budweiser when the frogs came out and started saying Budweiser? Everybody remembers the commercial, but I don't think anybody changed to the product because of the commercial. There was no compelling reason for the customer to buy it, uh, at least that I saw. So uh, what's happened, and, and just so you know, the other part of that same thing is the uh, a long time ago, 50 years plus, uh, TV commercials were two and three minutes long. There weren't that many of them, and then you know, so they could go that long. In that two to three minutes, they had enough time to talk about what the client was, what the potential client was doing, what the problems were, and, and what might affect them, and those kind of things. And they told the whole story so that the person could relate to it. The person watching that ad could relate to it, or listening to the ad could relate to it. And what's happened is now. TV commercials are 30 seconds, 20 seconds, 15, some 10, and you just don't have time for that. And a lot of the world has gone to slogans instead of trying to relate to the client, okay? Uh, Nike, just do it. McDonald's, I'm loving it. Uh, those are great if you're Nike McDonald's, but if you're the average Joe and you're an insurance agent or a financial advisor, you don't have that clout built in already. Uh, you've got to figure out a different way to get into the head of the, of the person that you're trying to talk to. And it's what we call the conversion equation, interrupting the conversation that's in their head and then engage into that conversation and, and talk about what happens if, and then educate them on, yes, there's a, bitter, a better way, not a bitter way, that would be terrible. <laughs> yes, there is a better way. And then, then come up with an incredible offer that they can't refuse. And that offer many times would be something that would be a no risk or a money back guarantee, something like that. I know the insurance industry has got laws and so forth where you have to be real careful about offers and so forth. You have to, there's, there's regulations and that kind of thing. But if you can give them some value in what you are offering, besides just the ability to sell them a product, because let's face it, there's a lot of people that have the same product you have access to, right guys? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So we got to, you got to differentiate yourself. And a lot of times it's the marketing and what we call direct advertising, something that evokes a call to action, uh, something that overcomes a sales objection, something that answers the major questions, uh, something that promises some kind of a performance, a result, and then backs it up again with the risk-free or, or guarantee, uh, money-back guarantee. So uh, that would be the, the, is that the third one? That's the third one. Uh, the fourth one, it, what I call a drip campaign. Uh, I know I've talked to an awful lot of uh, financial advisors and agents who really didn't utilize a CRM very well, a, a contact relationship manager, something that would send out emails that would keep them in front of, in the mind of the, the potential client. Now, you don't just say, hey, I, I, I want to talk to you again, or just following up. By the way, just following up is probably the worst thing you can do in an email or a phone call or phone message uh, to say that because you're not bringing anything of value. Uh, it, I know, preaching to the choir. But uh, the interesting thing about a drip campaign is that you can set them up to automate. And the, more you, the longer you're in business, the more people you should have gathered their email address and give them something of value. The interesting thing about drip, drip campaigns is small business owners on average, only about one to 3% of their prospects are I'm gonna buy it now kind of people. They've already heard about you. They've already decided on the product. They were referred to you that somebody that they trust and it's not a question. Most of the time, that's where, where the, that buy happens is only one to 3%. 97 to 99% are not ready to purchase that day. Uh, maybe not that product, maybe something else entirely. So if that many people aren't ready now, wouldn't it be best if you could get in front of them? If about 80% of all sales everywhere, not insurance or any one particular niche, about 80% of all sales occur between the fifth and the 12th point of contact between the business and the prospect. Some will say between the fifth and the 17th point of contact. 
So my question to any insurance agent or financial advisor would be, how many, are, how many times are you sending something of value to your potential client? Because if you're only stopping at seven and the eighth, ninth, 10th, or 12th, or 17th would have done the thing, that's your fault, not theirs. Okay. It's common sense. You need to know your numbers and then you have to have a follow-up campaign. You can automate all this stuff too, by the way. Absolutely. And those have, that, that has changed tremendously in the time that I've been in the marketing side. But I can't tell you how many people I talk to. I say, well, what CRM are you using? And they ask me, what's a CRM? That's the one that really scares me. But uh, I use an Excel sheet. It's like, okay, that's not going to automate the emails for you and that kind of thing. Uh, I have a little bit of a background in automation and integration. So I, I know exactly where you're talking about, Tim. Is, is, wait a minute. Uh, we need to figure out how to send these on an automatic basis. It's easier to write the email once and have that machine, so to speak, send it out to the people with the proper heading, the proper greeting, and, and so forth. Uh, it really doesn't take that much time. It doesn't take that much effort. But if 80% of business is happening between the fifth and the 12th point, it does not make any sense not to. So okay. what's the final point that uh, you're excited about? Okay. The final point is this, and I, I mentioned it a little bit before the break. Uh, it is basically this. If you've got a business owner that you're wanting to talk to, maybe he's already a client. Maybe he's somebody you're, you're thinking about uh, pitching some kind of a concept, or maybe it's somebody that's brand new, okay? And you were to go to that person and say, look, I've got a way for you to see in real life $100,000 plus per year come to you tax-free at age 67. And that's for the people that, let's say you've got a 50-year-old. That 50-year-old's retirement age is probably 67 unless they change them again. Uh at 67 and more, that you're going to get 100,000 plus. You're going to have a million dollars plus in burial uh, benefit and, you know, for your beneficiaries. So when you're done getting all that income, there's still money left over for your family. And we're going to show you how you don't have to spend a single penny of your money to set that all up. I'm not sure how a business owner would listen to that. And once they get past the, I'm not sure I can believe that, it sounds too good to be true. I get that. But the catch is, of all the things, if there's a catch, of all the things I just explained about market-dominating position and drip campaign and leads and joint ventures and so forth, those are just four of the 12 different categories and headings of the way that I can increase the profit and profit margin of a company, of a business, without them spending any money. Okay. So what I'm going to do is help them keep more money on the table rather than take money from the table, put it in their pockets, how I should say it. Instead of leaving money on the table, take that money. And yes, some of them are going to say, no, I want to put it in my business. OK, but you just presented them a concept where they said, you know what, that's fantastic. But they just don't pull the trigger because a lot of times from my experience, it was the price uh, objection. I just don't want to part with that much money, even though it's going into a plan that there's cash values and so forth. They just didn't see it that way. They just couldn't pull the trigger. If I went into that same person and say, look, I can take a look at your business and find you the money to be able to fund that program. And by the way, it will only take about 10 years of funding it. Uh, and by the way, I also get paid in that 10 years to be able to give them all that money. Uh, you're talking about 10 years of payment going in, a few years waiting, uh, seven years waiting for that money to start coming out. How does a business owner justify, I don't have to spend any money, I have no net money out of pocket, I'm gonna get 100,000 plus per year, and I'm gonna leave a million dollars to my, my family when I'm done. I'm not sure how you get past that. Any ideas, guys? You mean how I any ideas on why somebody wouldn't at least take a look at it? Uh, the, the only thing I can think of, honestly, it, the two, well, two things. One is the sounds too good to be true and don't waste my time. And that's just somebody who won't listen. If you've, if you've already pitched the idea or they're already a client, that's not a problem. Going into a brand new business owner, that might be an issue. But that's usually not the thing you'll lead with. You're talking about tax-free retirement with that person. So. The other thing, 
the only other thing I could think of is the agent doesn't want to learn something new, but I'm not trying to teach the agent how to do all this and, and increase the profit and profit margin. I'm going to do that for the client. Now, the what's in it for me, when I go through the software with the business owner, that business owner is going to answer several questions and I'm going to show them based on ultra conservative numbers that they give me on what kind of results they should see based on what we talked about. I'm going to be able to give them numbers where the, uh, I'm going to only charge them about 50% of the first year money that I'm able to put back in their pocket. So in other words, of that 100,000 I just spoke of, I'm, I'm going to take 50,000 for my fee for implementing all those strategies. But after that one year, I'm done. And it might take less than that. Very few take more than that, but it might take less than that. So I'm going to take less than half of what I put in their pocket. And by the way, that's in a written guarantee. The only time I'm getting paid is if I ask the business owner, would you like help implementing these strategies? I'll give them the blueprint of the things we cover in the 45, 55 minutes of the software. I'll give them that, but quite frankly, if they don't have time to implement them, it's really not going to do any good. Most people are okay with the idea of, look, I'm going to make you at least double what I'm going to put into this. And by the way, I'm not selling it. I just ask them if they'd like help implementing. And, and I'm going to get money that I make for them anyway. So, um, yeah, I just wanted Jeff to be able to go through those like five points, get a, you know, a, a bird's eye view, you know, a 30,000 foot view of all that uh, stuff. So we're going to be doing a webinar here uh, coming up pretty soon. That he's going to go through, you know, more succinct, specific uh, examples of everything here coming up uh, in the not too distant future. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, that's good. And then we'll take a quick break. And then when we get back, uh, we'll flip the script and let uh, we'll let Jeff ask me any question he has on health. We'll be right back. You want the absolute best for yourself and you want it to be easy. That's why we created Green 85. It helps with detoxifying the body gently. We're proud it's chemical free, unlike almost all other supplements you'll find. Bottom line, Green 85 will get you healthier. We look forward to hearing what Green 85 did for you. To get this product and our other amazing products, go to chemicalfreebody.com. That's chemicalfreebody.com. What's up, and Richards? Tim James here. I'm back with my Carter, with my Carter, hey. and uh, hey. hanging out with with Jeff. Hey. Uh, Jeff, this is the this is the part of the, our, our show where we do the health part. You know, it's the health and wealth podcast, and you know, it it really doesn't matter how wealthy somebody is, or even if they're not wealthy. When people are in pain, when people are suffering, when they're living in any type of fear, especially fear of their own health, whether it's cancer or They've got uh, MS or diabetes, so they're overweight or whatever it might be. It's it's kind of this nagging concern, and there's always a worry and fear going on there. And it's and typically when this stuff is happening, there's there's side effects already happening. The body's talking to them, but they just don't know what to do. And then usually the prescription literally is um, a band aid to hide symptoms that comes with a ninety percent side effect rate, and that is where we are today. And I will argue with anybody, I don't care how much alphabet soup they have behind their name, how many degrees and pedigrees, is that um, things are not working. Well, we've, we've made major advancements in science, yet uh, human beings, especially in America, are sicker than we've ever been. We're at the point now where, uh, actually, I, I have this, uh, this chart up. I, wonder if I, I, can't, I don't know if I can share screen, but the bottom line is, is that life expectancy right now in America is dropping like a rock. So what that means is, is that not only is the quality of life getting worse, but our children today and our grandchildren will die sooner than us. Let me repeat what's going on. Our children and grandchildren are going to die sooner than we are, the, the adults that are alive today. That's what's happening. All the other countries, if you aggregate them, you can see about 1980 
1984, the United States was keeping up with all the industrialized nations as life expectancy was increasing from certain things, medical advances, uh, whatever. And all of a sudden, around 1984, the U.S. started kind of flatlining a little bit as the other countries continued to rise. And then about 2014, we flatlined even more and started trending down. And there's been a severe drop. Now it's like it's on a severe downward slope. We're talking big time slope. And so this is where working class people really need to wake up and understand that the politicians writing these these uh, writing the policies, putting the policies into place, voting these policies into place. The people in the medical community that are mostly hijacked doctors, nurses and doctors, part of a broken system. The media is failed them, and so has the judicial system and even Hollywood. So they kind of all work together, what I've seen. So I, as the way I look at it is everybody needs to be fired. Like if, if the bottom line is, is that if Americans, if, you, if we're running businesses and the business of, you know, the politicians, and the medical community and the, and the media and all this stuff, they're all intertwined. And now our children are dying younger than us. They're, they don't know what they're doing. They suck at what they do. And they would be need to be fired immediately. It's like having an employee, and it's like, oh, well, she was supposed to, she was hired because she wanted, she had a computer science major, but she doesn't know how to use a mouse on a computer, and she can't complete her job, and she's not helping the end user. She needs to be fired. She needs to go somewhere else, maybe work in a daycare and help kids, and she would thrive there. But right now, that's where we're at with our health. So this is the point where, um, I, I where you ask your questions, buddy, and then I'll do my best I can to help you. Uh, to help yourself. Okay. I, I appreciate that. And, and it, by the way, I used to do stand up comedy professionally. And when somebody says that the children and grandchildren will not live as long, that's the only time I've ever felt good about not having any kids in my life. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So my question is around this and it's around some family members and it's around probably myself. Uh, I want to know. Probably more himself. About, probably. Well, okay. Not diagnosed. Not okay, diagnosed, okay. but self-diagnosed. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have been trained in some, dangerously trained in some neuropathy, and I am I'm overweight, and I have been told by a chiropractor that, oh, you must be a diabetic, too. And I said, I've never been diagnosed as diabetic. My A1C was 6.3, which put me borderline, according to the person who told me that. And th here's the reason I bring all this up. Uh, I had edema in my legs, uh, everything from the knee down, uh, my left foot looked like the, uh, take a Nerf football, cut it in half. That's about what my, my left foot looked like. Uh, the, everything from the calf down, uh, was either purple, dark purple, blue, uh, shiny. Uh, I, I had all kinds of things going on and, Again, never been diagnosed as diabetic. Now, in the last four months, I have lost about 45 pounds, and I have been doing uh, a couple of things to do that. One mostly is juicing. Um, I've got a juicer, and I absolutely love uh, making juice. And you're wondering, where the heck's the question come? Uh, <laughs> thing I've done is I've, I've gotten rid of the uh, – I'm eating almost no carbs. Carbs is like accidentally – uh, had rice with a meal a while back and uh, some tortilla chips with some ceviche because I'm in Puerto Vallarta. Anyway, right. uh, so the, the weight loss and my wife has, my God love my Russian wife, puts my feet into this big vat of, of hot water and puts a mineral bath into it and rubs the minerals on my legs. My legs are almost normal color now. This has only been, remember, she only got here May 5th and didn't start till probably the 7th or 8th. And today's only the 16th and she hasn't done it today yet. So in about a week, she has been able to uh, just about clear up my legs. That doesn't mean I'm not diabetic. It doesn't mean I'm, I don't have edema. There's still a little bit left. But my curiosity is if you have edema and that kind of coloring going on in your leg, is it always diabetes? Is it always a neuropathy, a diabetic neuropathy? And, and if you could just talk about that, I'd like to know more about your knowledge of that subject, if you could. Well, the first thing is, is that I'm not a doctor. And uh, but number one, we've dealt with a lot of this. OK, the way I look at it 
Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Okay. It doesn't really matter what you call it. What matters is, is that your body is sending you signals telling you that you're in, you need to change your environment. Yep. And when I mean your environment, I'm talking about, you need to look at everything that your body and your soul comes into contact with, meaning the air you breathe. Sure. Which could be like, there could be mold in the house as an example. Uh, number two, um, maybe you're somewhere where there's not a lot of sunshine where you are, right? But other people might have vitamin D deficiencies. Um, the, the water you're drinking, is it, is it clean? Um, the food you're eating, is it fresh or is it processed? Is it full of chemicals? Um, do you move your body on the daily? Cause your body's designed to move. And if you're not moving it, then you see what I'm saying? So it's the, it's, it's the environment. Also, are you in contact with mother earth? Um, are you taking prescriptions? All these things. So I call them check body lights. That's what they are. If your car, you're driving your car down the road and all of a sudden a red light starts flashing and says check engine. You're like, oh shit, I got to get this into the shop. Cause right. if I don't, I keep driving it. It could be a bigger repair bill or the car is going to break down and leave you stranded. Same thing with the body in this analogy. Right. 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 So when you're overweight, that's a check body light. When your legs turn blue, purple, those are check body lights. When your legs are the size of a Nerf ball and they turn, they're purple and swollen. This is check body lights. And so whether you have edema or you have type two diabetes or there's neuropathy, you have tingling or you have numbness and stuff in your feet. I had until I, I took a treatment from a very well-known neurologist out of Italy uh, that gave me a cold laser and red, red and white laser lights and put the pads on my, okay. on, on the affected area. And that worked extremely well to the point where I got rid of my symptoms completely. Okay, so and that's and that's good. Now, the one thing we we look at because light therapy is I'm totally into light therapy. I think it's fantastic, and we are actually, I mean, it's kind of a dissertation, but we're we're living light beings. And I somebody told me this when I first got into this, and I was like, oh, that's woo BS. But I mean, the bottom Same line here. is is that all life on this planet is captured on the leaf of a plant via photosynthesis, and so the biophotons, the light is captured on the leaf of that plant, which generates electrons through chlorophyll and photosynthesis. So, um, and, and the closer you are to that type of food, as an example, the healthier you're going to be. So we, we literally are because as we consume food or eat an animal that consume that food, we're actually eating light, right? And we are electrical beings, right? That's why when they hook you up to an EKG, it's like beep, it beep. Works. That's an electrical impulse, okay? So electric, it light, it all adds up, right? It's kind of common sense when you take a moment and just look at it. So being that, I mean, that's what I'm saying, light therapy is great. But just like we have a product that's a very amazing, uh, it's actually a breakthrough in, in anti-inflammatory, which is called Turmeric 100. But when people take it, my question is like, okay, yeah, it's, it's helping with your symptoms, possibly your arthritis, your neuropathy, this kind of stuff. Um, but we still want to look at the root cause. Why were you having this problem in the first place? And again, it, re it revolves around lifestyle and the environment. Because even though maybe Turmeric 100 would be a super duper bandage for an inflammation state, we still want to address the underlying cause. Right. Rather than it's just like, well, hey, doc, what's going on? Well, here, take the purple pill and you don't have to worry about it. Okay, yeah, don't change my diet. Nope, don't worry about that. Just keep doing what you're doing. So you're not really helping the person. You're giving them a bandage whether it's a pharmaceutical drug or sometimes an herb or a food or something like that, or, right. you know, something like that, maybe even juicing. It could be because if we're not getting, what's the, what was causing all of this stuff? So again, we want to get to the root of it because the bottom line is, is that especially a guy like you, you're entrepreneurial, you're out there hustling, you're doing your stuff. And it's kind of all for naught. If you're in pain, you don't feel good. You're worried about getting your toes, your leg cut off, or you could just die of a heart attack or have a stroke or something. It's like, what's the point? And we're here to, to, to learn and grow and contribute, teach and serve other people, you know, and to be able to do that at your best, you have to have that physical body. It should be running like a top. So and the only reason right now, and Carter knows that you don't have the actual health that you want, that you deserve, that was given to you by our creator is because you've been distracted. You've been led astray, processed food, society, parents, uh, the way things go. And you've been, you just have not made your health a priority. Now, a lot of people start making their health a priority once the alarm bells go off and all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, like it's bad. And then people start to change. 
Or some people actually get enlightened and they see a friend go through a bunch of crap or a family member. And they're like, well, maybe I need to get ahead of the curve. They start doing stuff. Hopefully what we teach over here at our, in our program and stuff is that you don't want to operate out of fear because fear actually is going to slow down the healing process. You want to look at your, you know, your, your, your situation right now with your, with your edema, the not neuropathy, whatever. These are gifts, the creator that gave you. It's, it's a very built-in intelligence letting you know that it's time to, it's time to change your life. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences, right? There's going to be consequences. So you and everybody else, no matter what stage four cancer, um, whether you're overweight, you have neuropathy, maybe you have a yeast infection, all these different things. The reality is, is that your immune system has dropped. Okay. And why it's dropped, there's three things. Number one, you're polluted. Your blood is polluted. Your fat and your muscle tissue is 500 to 1,000 percent more polluted with chemicals than even the blood serums that we could test. We, the umbilical cord tests show us this. Every time I come on here, almost I'm like, go look up these three words: umbilical cord chemical. Type it into your browser: umbilical cord chemical, and you'll see every single child being born today, Jeff, is full of toxic chemicals. And there's over 180 that cause cancer. They're in the womb. So the older you are, how old are you? I'm 61. So you're 61. So you have had 61 years to accumulate more toxins from the air you breathe, the water you drink, and the toxic clothing and deodorants and stuff like that that you put on your body and toothpaste and all this bullshit. So even more polluted than a child. And eventually, shit breaks down, right? The dam breaks. Uh, number two, you have tremendous amounts of stress in your body today. Physical stress, emotional stress. You've been, you haven't seen your wife in a year. I'm, I'll, I'll be, everybody's got all different kinds of stress going on, right? electromagnetic stress there's all kinds of stuff coming at you you have you, you cannot heal if you're in a stressed out you have to have a daily practice to to mitigate that stress and reduce that stress period and if you do that you're going to speed up the healing process and the third thing is then flooding your body with nature that's real nutrition this is carbon-based nutrition for your carbon-based body not synthetic ascorbic acid vitamin c but if you're going to put vitamin c in your body it would actually come from a natural source like an omla berry or a uh, Arcella cherry or a camu camu berry or rose hips or something like that. Something that's actually made in nature, not in a lab. And then because ascorbic acid is an example is the same as putting a toxic chemical in your body. It's pretty much right. Now there are some people who argue with me on that in, in emergency situations. Yeah. Maybe you do need some antibiotics or you, maybe some uh, ascorbic acid would help you, but if you plan ahead, then why would you go that route when you have something that will your body will naturally work with, right? So my my suggestion to you is is um, don't get caught up so much in the details of exactly the name of it, even though it's good to have diagnosis and stuff. Don't just just realize that it's like, oh, my leg hurts. Now what the hell am I going to do about it? That's where you want to get. And when you have that self-empowerment, when you can take complete charge of your health, that's when things are going to start changing for you. Right. Right. But, cool. but if somebody tries to, you know, oh, do this and do that and do that. And, and, or, and then it's like, and you don't have to do much. That's not going to be the long-term solution for you. you. You're really going to have to change your lifestyle. And it doesn't have to be that hard. You know, increasing your water intake. You're already doing some stuff right now. You're juicing. You're doing these foot soaks. Um, I could share some stuff with you. There's a certain sauna that you should get. Carter will tell you about it. That will change your life. Um, I actually have uh, products like there. Actually, this product behind me, our green product is so concentrated. We actually had a, a gal that um, I mean, years ago was one of the first people I dealt with that had neuropathy. She was a uh, I, I helped some uh, I worked with like uh, uh, Wisnia, Washington State Narcotics Investigators Association. And um bunch of the, the policemen actually started buying the products and one, and one of the gals heard about it that worked in the office there in central Washington and she had neuropathy in her feet and she'd been buying our greens forever and I just was doing customer calls and talking to her and she's like oh I love this stuff she's like as long as I take it I don't have my neuropathy and I was like cool I was like but if you don't take it then you still have it she's like yeah I said well let's get to the root of the cause do you want to do that and she's like nope I'll just I'll just want to drink it I'm fine I'm like okay so it slowly was helping her because it was helping her detox and it was helping her get some nutrition. Right. But there was there was a deeper level because she was still putting the same crap in her body. She didn't change her lifestyle as far as the food intake. And I don't know, maybe she had moldy carpets. Maybe she had 
you know, uh, paint that was off gassing in the home or a combination of this stuff. There's so many things. So what we do is we look at everything that you, you breathe, um, that, that you drink, you eat, all these types of things. And then we help you just make better choices. Instead of buying from this company, you vote with your dollars and you buy from that company, you actually put something good in your body. Or you just make it yourself. You just start making some stuff yourself, like you're juicing and stuff like that. So what's a, what's a day like for you? Like, what do you do? Uh, just give me a snapshot. When you wake up, what's the first thing you put in your mouth? Uh, it's usually juice. And the juice what, consists it? of, it, it's got uh, celery, green apples, spinach, ginger, uh, carrots, uh, sometimes a little bit of pepper. A, like a yellow, a yellow pepper. Uh, let me think. What else is in there? Cucumber. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Cucumbers. Yes. Thank you. And uh, parsley, uh, cilantro. I like the cilantro. It makes it a little spicy. Sure. Um, I think that's most of it. Occasionally, I'll put a little pineapple in there, but th that's just occasionally. Sometimes a, a, a bit of beet, okay. um, which makes everything so red anyway. Um, yeah, that's that's got most of it. Okay, I think. so like if I if, if you asked me to coach you, I would say that's fantastic. You're doing what you're doing. I would, in your situation, I would probably limit. The green apples are great because they're lower in sugar. I would go with them, and very little carrot and beet. Um, you know, a, a quart of carrot juice has about about a cup of sugar in it, half a cup of sugar. So it's 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 really high in sugar. I'm Just usually me. taking I'm usually taking two or three carrots and juicing them, and so I mean it's. Very, right, very right. so just 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 to be safe because it can be a lot of sugar okay what's next uh normally well, what i've been doing lately is cooking my dinner for my wife which has been including <clears throat> usually like a steamed broccoli uh it's got uh, a little bit of fish which is either mahi mahi usually mahi mahi and then uh some uh shrimp cooked with okay. very little additives and that kind of thing but she I can't, my wife, my wife is five foot three and 133 pounds. Okay. I can't make her go on a diet with me. Uh, so I, I, I make her eat and sometimes I, I usually end up cooking it. So sometimes it's difficult to cook hers and not eat some of it as well. So it's, yeah, well, it's the whole thing is, is like if, if, if you're a healthy person, you, you know, it's not, you, what, dieting is like kind of a weird term. It's like in nature, there's no animal that diets. They just eat their natural food. And so that's what a human being should do. You guys should both be able to eat similar stuff and have no issues with it. So you juice in the morning. What do you do after the juice? Uh, well, then lunchtime is the, the cooking of some kind of a meal usually. And then dinner time is juice again. Okay. So you have one meal, one heavy meal a day. Yeah, and it's not all that heavy, quite frankly, considering what I used to eat. I, I know what you're getting at. But uh, sometimes we'll have uh, maybe some watermelon or honeydew or cantaloupe. Okay. Mostly because it's so darn fresh and good here. You've sure, ever been to Florida right. and have the vegetables that's, and fruits and vegetables that's amazing here. Yeah. So typically when somebody's like having these issues, like especially with type 2 diabetes, it's not really, I mean, this blood sugar is floating around in the blood, right? That's why those A1Cs are high. It's because the sugar can't, the glucose can't get into the cell. And that's typically a fat issue. So you're having poor fats, fried foods. So you want to stay away from cooking your oils it literally calls it causes the uh the oil to turn into what's called a lipid peroxide it's a known carcinogen anytime you cook oils over a certain temperature so we have people cook stuff dry air fry if they're going to cook food take the oils afterwards and baste it on with seasonings and then that way you're not doing that but avocado is really good sprouted nuts are going to have good omegas in them um there's uh red raspberry seed extract oil um, one of the best things is like flax, flaxseed water. You can make flax water and always have that in your fridge. That's that's great for the gastrointestinal tract. So in somebody in your situation, in the beginning, though, I would be looking at getting my colon clean. Uh, we have a product called Gut Detox. Uh, if you don't have colon hydrotherapy in your area, and even if you do, I would have you on Gut Detox immediately. Um, taking that, drinking the greens uh, twice a day, making those juices or at least throwing the scoops of powder in there to flood the body with the nutrition that's missing in the soil today. And um, if you can get colon hydrotherapy, I'd be doing that. And there's also foot spas you can do. You're doing the foot soaks, but we actually have some foot spas, infrared saunas. You want a daily detox practice, Jeff. That's what you want. You've done a lot of years of accumulation and it's going to take a long time to clean up 
the body can't even release all of it all at once or it'll kill you literally. Right. Right. So this is going to be a lifestyle that you're going to set up a daily detox lifestyle. And what's going to happen is slowly but surely your body is going to be able to release stuff as it can. Your fat cells are completely polluted with toxins right now so right. As, a, as, a, as a protective mechanism. That's why a lot of people, they, they start gaining weight and they can't even figure out why. It's because the amount of toxins because of bioaccumulation. Remember, the umbilical cord studies are showing that there's 180 cancer-causing chemicals in the womb of babies and young mothers that are supposed to be healthy. And by the time you're 61, the cup's full. And instead of killing you, your body's intelligent, so it stores fat. It makes fat to store the chemicals in so you don't die. So cleaning up the colon, cleaning up the colon. The average person's got 6 to 12 pounds of impacted fecal material. The record that I've seen, one lady had 27 pounds of impacted fe fecal material come out of her in a one-hour colon hydrotherapy session. This is where you sit on a tube rectally and water gently goes in and out of your colon. You just basically go to the bathroom and it cleans the walls of the colon, and she dropped 27 pounds in an hour. Wow. But the average person's about 6, 12, 15 pounds of that funk and gunk and junk in there, and it's creating an acidic environment, housing viruses, bacteria, mold, yeast, fungus, mutagens, sure. par parasites, and all that crap. So look sure. at your body like a car, like a tractor. The engine's plugged up. Um, the fuel lines are plugged up and it's your job, not just to eat better, but to get in there and rotor rooter stuff with a, with a lifestyle, colon hydrotherapy, enemas, Kalima boards. These are all things you can do at home. Um, taking things like gut detox, drinking flax water. And we just watch people basically come back to life, but you have to do it yourself. So like hopefully it. that'll help you, my friend. And there's, so you always have, we were here to help if you have any other questions. You, do you have anything else? Uh, no, you. I, I love that you, you, you use the word accumulation. That's the nicest I've ever heard of what I've done to myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, what the doctor told me, uh, basically in a group of people, I was talking to another guy, but he said, he said, look, you've done a lot of shitty things to yourself <laughs> over the years. And, yeah. you know, now you're here you are. So. Three years of sedentary from COVID didn't help either. That's yeah, and you're you're taking you know you're you're you, you this is it has to be a lifestyle. You, this is not take a pill and tomorrow you're better program. And that's what we've been right. programmed. Like oh, I'll take a pill and everything's hunky dory. The they they show you on TV. Oh, you got this, you got that, and you're feeling crappy. Take this, and then all of a sudden you're you know dancing through a field full of flowers. That's not how life right. works, right? right. There could, it, it's going to be ups and downs and ups and downs, but the trend's going to be up when you start loving yourself and you start taking action on the daily, the weekly and the monthly basis and quarterly basis, doing sure. certain things. And we definitely have those sure. protocols outlined that I've done in my own life. And you know, I'm 50 years old and I, I literally feel like I'm 18 and, and it doesn't really matter what age you are. I know people in their eighties that are healthier than me. So, and I aspire to do what they do. And I've been researching what their lives are and what they eat when they wake up, what they do and how they live and how they treat themselves and how they treat other people. And if you model that, you can have the same level of happiness and health that they do. It just takes a little bit of time and a little love. Yeah, and, and I'll just I'll just say this as we're uh, getting ready to head out of here, um, let the enrichers go. The the very first time, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Tim was talking to one of our guests. I can't remember exactly who it was, but he was saying how it was about making your health a priority. And I got to thinking to myself, yeah, you just have to make it a priority, right? And that's what I wasn't doing that myself. I not. Mean, and, you know, my wife, super healthy and everything. And, um, you know, even herself and making it a priority is is really our theme every single day. Right. And, and that self-love is by making your own health a priority. And of course, you know, my wife, she's seven years you know, younger than me. She's like, I got to have the big guy. Right. So she helps me to stay motivated. But it was that one sentence that Tim said, making your health a priority that you're not doing. I thought to myself. I'm not making my health a priority. I better start doing that. Yeah. And for the listeners out there, don't bullshit yourself either. And be like, oh, I don't have time. I've got to focus on making money. I got to spend time with my kids. I got to spend time with my wife. All of those things. All of your, I have, I have to spend time at the church. I got to spend time with God, whatever it is, your finances, all those things, they will all improve. You will have better, if you have a better relationship with your, if you have better health, you're going to have a better relationship with yourself. You're going to have a better relationship with your friends, your family, the loved ones. You're going to have better finances. We've proven this. I've had people I've coached for health. And in six months, all the people on commission or own their own business, 21% increase in their, in their income in six months. 
focusing on their health. And I don't promote, I don't, we don't even hardly ever promote that at all. I, I forget about it and bring it up. I just had a guy do it one time that was a buddy of mine. We did the math and I went back and I called everybody up that was in that space where they had commission or owned a business. We, we averaged it over a bunch of people and it was 21% increase in business. Everything's going to get better. Your spiritual practice, everything gets better when you make your health a priority. And if you don't believe me, then you haven't tried it yet. Perfect. Perfect. I like well, it. Uh, hey, and Richards, I want to thank you for joining us for another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. And if you want to be able to go and see all of our previous wonderful guests, like, like Jeff Cothy, who is in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, you can go to our website at www.thehealthandwealthpodcastshow.com and make sure to like, share, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, wherever that might be. So for my fantastic <laughs> Mr. Chemical Free co-host, Tim James, I'm Carter Wilcox, and CEO and founder of CSI Financial Group, thanking you very much for coming to watch us here on the Health and Wealth Podcast. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate your time, your backstory, and, uh, and getting a chance to learn a little bit more about what it is that we do. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So until next time, Richards, we will see you on the Health and Wealth Podcast. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Enrichers. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Health and Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Carter Wilcoxon. And I'm your host, Tim James. And by God, we are committed to helping you guys have fat wallets, flat bellies. So tune in again for another episode and make sure to like, share, and drink a lot of water. Or beer. You have just listened to the Health and Wealth Podcast with Carter and Tim.